Our next two speakers are a great legal team here. Uh, Carlos Arcos is an elder law attorney. He's been practicing for almost 30 years and his focus is on elder care planning. <coughs> and Zach Tripotis, his focus is on estate planning and their... I have a handout, if we could hand this out. But it's more of an outline of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, but I want to just start off with um, what we're going to try and do is, is give you a survey of four stages that people go through. Um, and each stage is very important, and we could talk about each stage for about probably a couple hours. But we're going to go over these stages so that you could have sort of a framework to work from when you're dealing with aging parents, aging friends, or, or spouses. Um, so the, the first stage uh, that we're going to talk about is capacity. So that's when you're doing okay, when you can do the love letter, when you can do the trust and the will. The second stage is about when your capacity is starting to go. If you, you start fluctuating, maybe there's a diagnosis with, with uh, Alzheimer's and it's still mild, you may still be able to do some planning. The third stage is where there is no capacity or the capacity is very, very limited. And finally, the last stage, of course, would be death. So I'm going to start with capacity. Uh, so one of the things you want to talk about is um, having an estate plan. And, and one of the questions I quite often get uh, from uh, third parties, that would be a son or a daughter, is how can I get my mom and dad to update their trust or to get a trust, trust done? And that's a really, really important uh, question. But often people have their own individual issues with what's holding them back. Uh, Zach, have you had any clients who have a hard time from creating an estate plan? Uh, usually you need a trustee. And do you ever have, have you ever had somebody say, you know, uh, they can't decide on a trustee? So uh, a lot of times uh, you'll get clients or will get clients that uh, you know they, they, they trust their children, they love their children, uh, but they have to pick one or they, you know they have a problem child maybe that they don't want to um, consider. So a lot of people um, have hang-ups on what what's preventing them from finishing the estate plan. Um, uh, but but choosing the trustee that's that's. That, that's often uh, a main one. So, so something that you want to keep in mind in choosing a trustee is you want to make sure you pick not necessarily the oldest or uh, the person who's more educated. The number one criteria is honesty. You want to pick someone who's reliable and someone who is financially set. Uh, it, sometimes people will pick the child who's actually living in the house and dependent on the parent as a trustee. In some cases that may be okay, uh, but I found that you could end up having disputes over missing money, etc. Uh, the other situation, and I don't know if you've experienced this, is where a client comes in and they have maybe a living trust and a will, but they don't have a power of attorney. Have you ever had that happen? Right, a, a lot of clients, um you know, if you think of young professionals, they're not really thinking, or they come in, or younger people come in to do an estate plan, they're not thinking about capacity issues. Um, when people get older, they start considering that. So a lot of people, they don't have a complete plan. A complete plan is going to be a living trust, it's going to be a will, it's going to be a, a financial power of attorney, and then a medical power of attorney. So um, some people have partial plans, and um, at certain stages in their life, they might realize it. So um, you, you want to make sure your plan is complete from the get-go so you, you don't have any holes that need to be plugged in later. And, uh, and then when you, when you do have a plan, uh, years will go by, maybe even decades, you need to take it out there every now and then and review that old trust, get the dust off, start looking through it. Are the people who are your successor trustees still around? Do they still live in the same location that is listed on the power of attorney in the trust? So you have to go through those uh, uh, issues. So Zach, under those bullet points, are there any other things, more modern things that we have to worry about putting in trust and powers of attorney? 
So uh, the law's changing all the time, so there, there might be things you don't realize. Um, one thing, of course, on the list, digital assets. Uh, digital assets are, are much more important now. You know, your email account, uh, the, the documents that you, you might have in your, your Dropbox or some surface like that, your photo library, all these are important and you want to make sure that uh, the person you trust to manage all your other assets has the ability to, um, to control those assets too. And what about uh, co-trustees? If a mother has, let's say, two sons, and, and it's obvious from your interview that the sons probably don't get along, but she wants them to be co-trustees, uh, normally, how's that situation handled? What would you advise? Uh, co-trustees uh, might seem like a simple solution, but uh, the, 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 there could be a lot of conflict. You could be setting up your, your family members for a lot of conflict. Um, if, there's a, if, if they can't agree to a decision, um, how are they going to how are they going to move forward? Um, you know, in a, situ in a situation like that, you might want to find a third party, a neutral person, who who the family trusts, who, who would be willing and able to make um, um, decisions in that case. Or even if you get have a family that gets along, uh, for example, um, I had a family of. Uh, they had three sons and they got along. They went camping together. They were, they were plumbers and they had their own business together. They were flipping homes. They were doing all kinds of things together. Uh, so that worked out perfect as co-trustees. Uh, but you also need to read your trust even if you don't have co-trustees. What if your first trustee can't do it and your second trustee died? Can your first trustee have the power to appoint another trustee? If you don't have these other mechanisms uh, uh, and you just have a default which says nothing other than maybe the vote of the majority beneficiaries, but it's nice to have something in there that allows someone else to appoint a trustee because if you don't have that, you end up going to court asking a judge to appoint someone. Um, another issue that uh, Liliana wanted me to touch on is something called spousal impoverishment and uh, Medi-Cal. And, and that's under the bullet point that I call a care plan provisions. Um, most estate plans are primarily about your stuff and who's going to get your stuff. And they're primarily about who's going to be in charge of your affairs if you're sick and make medical decisions, make decisions over your assets. Quite often, they don't address some of the issues that Gary mentioned regarding the family love letter. Where do you want to, what's your preference? Do you want to stay at home or is it an assisted living facility you're most familiar with that you want to go to? These are things that you could put in the trust and, and make it a little more legal. In some situations, it's better to use a family uh, uh, love letter. In other situations, there's something also called a letter of wishes. We sometimes use a letter of wishes. We don't want to make anyone do something uh, for example, you, you have to keep me in my house no matter what. What if there's eminent domain and they want to build a post office at your home? Which nowadays I don't even know why we need any more post offices, right? Uh, so you, you have all these issues that come up and there's no direction in the trust. The trust primarily, for the most part, traditionally has been a death plan. It's something that's implemented after someone passes away and that's important. Uh, but we also need to look at the tough issue. The tough issue is when they're alive, when they're, uh, and before they pass away, that time period when they're, they're disabled, they cannot take care of themselves. Then uh, the next bullet point is about impractical provisions. So when you're reviewing this old trust, and you should do it at least once a year, same time you, you talk to your financial advisor, when you go see your tax person, or whenever you're taking care of uh, you know, your documents and affairs for the year, Look at your trust and what does it say about how things are going to be distributed when you pass away. I've had situations, and, and Zach, you could also mention any, I had one situation where the parents wanted to leave the home to all six children. And there's only one living there. And I call that fair, but, you know, equal, but not fair, because they have to wait till the one living there passes away. Now, there may, there may be a different situation, maybe the one that's living there took care of mom for 10 years, then took care of dad for 15 years. So we don't know all the facts, so you have to address these issues and update the trust to fit the situation. Um, uh, 
Uh, any other practical distribution provisions you've come across? Yeah, I, I, I've, I've come across instances where people are making lots of specific gifts to, you know, family, friends, you know, $50,000 here, $30,000 there. Then they leave, leave everything else to who they really want to leave the bulk of the stuff to. Um, then their, their, their assets change, and it turns out that they're really not leaving a lot to them at the end. So um, updating specific gifts is important, too. And then finally, uh, consider adding Medi-Cal provisions to your power of attorney and your trust in situations where uh, you may outlive your money. Uh, and especially if you have parents who may not have uh, uh, sufficient funds to cover their care, even though we do have what's called filial law, laws, laws that require you to support your parents, we actually have those on the books. They're not currently enforced um, in California. However, more and more as people are aging, uh, we may start seeing laws where you might be required to support your parents and they may enforce that. In fact, there was a case a few years ago in Pennsylvania where a gentleman um, uh, signed an agreement with a nursing home for his mom to stay in, and then she was there for, I don't know, 10 months or so, and then he took off, and she uh, uh, ended up uh, passing away. He took off to another country. When he came back, they sued him, and they were able to collect on him. On, on just on the, They couldn't collect on, by contract, but they actually applied a filial law saying that because it's your parent and you're the closest relative, you have a duty to support her. And they were able to collect against him as, as, a, as creditors. Uh, the next level of capacity is uh, fluctuating capacity. And so this is your last chance when you're still somewhat aware and you still have some brain function and have enough enough ability to communicate with an attorney and go back and forth in a, in a meaningful communication as to what adjustments you need to make in your estate plan. I had a case one time where a lady, um, she was a psychologist, she had a massive stroke, she was only 68 years old, and she was in a subacute. The subacute is, is the level of care is right below hospital care. Hospital, as you know, is acute. It, it, so it's a little bit beyond a nursing level care. And in the subacute, she was getting all kinds of assistance with everything. She really couldn't move. And additionally, she weighed probably about almost 300 pounds. Uh, so it's very difficult to care for her. Uh, and what would happen is when I would go visit her, she was totally alert, total brain function. And the way we communicated by it was by pointing at a chart with letters. And we were able to make adjustments to her estate plan to fit the situation because she was running out of money. Being in a subacute will cost anywhere between fifteen to twenty thousand um, dollars. The uh, are we okay with time? Uh, you're okay with time. Okay, and then um, I'm going to skip down to um, let's see. Let's go to a limited or no capacity. Now we have a situation where maybe there is no plan or no power of attorney. You have a living trust. Your documents are incomplete or no pen. So, Zan, can you define what a conservatorship is and what you, when is a conservatorship necessary? So, a conservatorship is a court supervised proceeding uh, where basically the court, the state, is deciding that um, someone doesn't have the ability to make decisions for themselves. And then the state is basically taking your rights away. And they're appointing someone to be the conservator to make all those decisions. And it's a court-supervised process for uh, managing your financial affairs and your medical affairs. Um, and it's, it's, it's a long process, it's a costly process, but sometimes it's necessary. And, um, but um, it, it, it's, it's court-supervised, and so everything's public. So all these filings um, are public, and you have to account to the court, you have to post bonds. So it's not, it's, it, if, if you're able to avoid it, you would like, you want to avoid it. By, uh, by making plans ahead of time. Uh, in your journey, you may have people approach you and tell you you need to get a conservatorship or people will mention this word to you. Uh, uh, my firm doesn't do conservatorship, Zach's firm does. In fact, we refer to his firm quite often when it's the last resort in terms of having to do a conservatorship. But there's some cases where people have gone through their journeys without the need of a conservatorship. 
Usually conservatorships come about when there's an extreme situation where the, the, there's so many problems or there's lots of financial abuse. Um, let's talk a little bit about the uh, issues with uh, caregivers. Anybody have caregivers at home? Or have a family with caregivers at home? Uh, be careful if you're hiring people who are not insured. Uh, we have excellent resources back there. You should hire agencies. People hire and pay them under the table sometimes because they, it appears that it's cheaper. No, it's more expensive. There's no uh, withholding for payroll. There's no workers' comp. Uh, your home insurance may not necessarily cover that. So you have to be very careful, and it's actually cheaper to hire an agency rather than do that. But sometimes people have someone who they really like. Well, then you better self-insure. You can get workers' comp insurance. There's something also called nanny payroll. You could use that to help you uh, with, your, with whoever you're caring for. Then there's lots of issues, and I have some handouts, in another presentation I'm doing on the 30th and on the 24th of this month, where we're gonna talk about, uh, it's on the table. It's on Brenda's table. Brenda's gonna be at that presentation as well. We're, go we're gonna get into the issues with assisted living, nursing homes, hospital stays, and boarding cares. Um, finally, uh, Zach, what happens in death if you do not have uh, uh, an estate plan normally? So if you don't, if you don't make a plan, um, you're back in court again, um, the, uh, and you have to do a probate proceeding, and this is a court-supervised um, uh, proceeding uh, where we determine what your liabilities are, what your assets are, and uh, we pay all your creditors. And, um, and, and we determine who is entitled to, um, to receive the assets. And, and in LA County especially, this, this could take a long time. Um, it's, it's not as cheap as, uh, as planning ahead and doing the state plan. And um, it, 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 in some cases, it could be, it could be an unnecessarily uh, stressful situation where you, uh, you want to avoid that. And uh, one more question, and then I'll sum up. We're okay with time. Um, and so this question, again, I'm gonna ask uh, Zach. What if you have a trust? Uh, uh, does a trust work this way? And, and I've seen people who actually believe this, that because you have a trust, there's really nothing to do. You don't need to call the team Gary referred to in, in the list in the, the family love letter. That there's nothing to do, that suddenly, at the funeral, dad's pockets the money just comes out and floats in the air and goes in the pockets of the three children sitting in the front porch, that there's nothing to do, there's a lot to do. So Zach, does the trust, uh, is the trust really more of a private administration compared to probate, which is public? Do people have to do some kind of administration? Are there some rules they have to comply with, the successor trustee? Uh, so yes, they do. There, it's, it's not a free-for-all. Uh, it's done privately. It's not. It's not court supervised. If, if, there, if there's no conflict, but uh, you, the, the trustee does have to do an accounting. They have to give notice to all the, the, the people. Um, um, and, and depending on the type of trust you have, there there might be some sophisticated planning that requires uh, finding sub trusts and, um, and and determining what you know how, how property is going to be allocated. And um, and then. The, 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 your state's big enough, there might even be estate tax consequences that, that you need to consider. So it's, it's, um, it, it, it could still be um, a, a process that you need to go through, but it's, it's done privately and out of court supervision. And uh, I didn't bring with me, sometimes I bring the code. The probate code is about this thick, and about half of it is about trust law. So if you're the successor trustee, or if your son is the successor trustee, or your friend or daughter, they're assumed to know that law. So that's a they really need to get assistance so, so someone could walk them through what the requirements are to comply with the trust, and so that they look good in are doing what their duty is uh, under the trust and, uh, for the benefit of the beneficiaries. So my last uh, uh, call to you at this point is a call to action. And I want to just say, you need to plan before your mind stops working. And if you get a second chance where it's still working but not so hard, 
you got to plan and do whatever you can. However, if your mind completely stops working altogether, others will have to work with what you have. And, and we've done that. We've dealt with that. And we will try to, as attorneys, we try to do the least invasive uh, approach remedy to the situation. Zach and I were talking about how uh, it's so difficult if you don't do some kind of planning. It, it, it's, a, a, you know, an, if you don't do any kind of planning, even just talking to an attorney, sometimes people are afraid to come in attorneys, attorneys you know, uh, are expensive, you go see an attorney, may have had a bad experience with an attorney, but you need to find someone referred to you uh, that they trusted that attorney, you need to see them so they could look at your situation. And when you, you know you find the right attorney when they're asking you a lot of questions and getting into the details that Gary was earlier talked to you about. So don't lose hope. Your family and friends should get help and guidance rather than go at it alone. Thank you. So I um, often go to an uh, attorney for this. One of the things they're worried about is how much it's going to cost. So if someone is, wants to see someone and get a rough idea, at what point can that attorney tell them, I think this will cost you about so and so much? Would that be their first <coughs> visit or do you know what I'm saying? Yes, that's a really good question because uh, what's happening now is um, you have the internet, so you have, in fact, uh, uh, Zach works with a colleague of mine that I went to law school with, uh, John Primeth, and we were in the same class. We went to UCLA Law School. The guy that started Legal Zoom went to UCLA Law School, and so uh, not Robert Shapiro. He just <laughs> to, to, to market the, the. But a lot of people are getting Legal Zoom, and. Uh, the, the issue really is, if you have a complicated situation, even if you don't have a lot of money, it could really, you could make a big mistake. Let me give you a quick example. Anybody remember going to the stationery store to get legal forms before the internet was here? Remember that? Remember the Wilcox forms? They had little boxes, it came in, it was red in certain boxes, and it was dark, uh, bold printing. Uh, this gentleman in the box that said real estate, he put his children from the first marriage. In the box that said personal property, he put his second wife who he loved dearly and was with her for 30 years. So when he died, all the real estate went to the kids that hated his second wife. So you really have to be careful when you fill out these forms. Uh, it's creating more work for attorneys in court and so you have to be very careful. And so, so, uh, so, so we, there's really no right or wrong answer. I'd rather have you sign and do something on your own than not have anything. But if you don't understand it, you really, at a minimum, should see uh, an attorney. As far as cost, um, most attorneys will charge, with experience, will charge for a consult. Uh, you should at least pay for a consult. That might be a couple hundred dollars, depending on the time. And, and if that consult, at that consult, once you disclose what your assets are, what issues you have, the attorney should give you a price range. And, um, and I think, you know, if you go to someone that, that, that was referred to you, that's probably going to be a good start. Uh, I wouldn't do it off the internet. I would definitely go from somebody that was personally referred to you. And as far as price range, um, I could get in trouble for trying to give, a, you know, there's price fixing and all that, um, but it, it shouldn't be more than, you know, average, I mean, a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars, it really depends. I mean, there's some large estates that there's a lot of, you know, somebody owns 24 properties, there's a lot more stuff that the time you're going to spend, but for your average person, it should be pretty affordable. Thank you very much.